Hello, well, I've come along today to speak on behalf of uh, Nick Gollidge and Laurie Menville and co-workers about some of the uh, work we've been doing looking at um, meltwater pulses from Antarctica. And this is quite a sort of long-standing debate, should we say, you know, has, is Antarctica a significant source of meltwater during the last deglaciation? Um, it's a long-standing debate from a terrestrial and also the marine regime. So we've been looking through the transition, looking for potential connections, essentially, between changes in MOC and changes in the ice sheet, looking for these sort of sensitive parts, these sensitive times during this climate transition. So when we look at meltwater pulses in the last glaciation, one really sticks out, which is meltwater pulse 1A. So it, it occurs during the, you know, the maximum warmth in northern hemisphere during the bowling aneroid. It's very difficult to kind of reconcile to actually deliver this amount of meltwater um, directly from the North Atlantic or other sources. So there's been a lot of work over the last few years that's focused down towards Antarctica and suggested there's a potential connection with Antarctica and perhaps events during that transition led to a substantial source coming out of Antarctica. The question being that if we put enough meltwater perhaps into the Southern Ocean, could we actually drive changes in circulation that might cause substantial changes to reverse onto the Antarctic ice sheet itself? Now, can we actually drive this purely from weakening of Antarctic bottom water formation. There's a lot of evidence at the moment that Antarctic bottom water formation is shrinking and actually freshening. So and with that, you get increased warming coming to the base of the Antarctic ice sheet. So using models, can we look at this and understand potential sensitivity some more? So past work by uh, Laurie Menville and co-workers has shown that there, there's a, a potential for reproducing the kind of paleoclimate evidence that we see during the Antarctic cold reversal by hosing experiments in the Southern Ocean. So in the paper in uh, QSR a few years ago, they basically showed that there was a real potential here for driving cooling over the Southern Hemisphere through changes in bottom water formation by hosing experiments in and around Antarctica. Now, the important thing here is you get the Try and get the mouse back on. I can't quite. Yes, okay, thank you. Try to. It's the important thing is that we get this change in atmospheric conditions over Antarctica when we drive fresh water into the Southern Ocean close to Antarctica. Now that provides us, let's say, with the ideal paleo proxy evidence that uh, fits the uh, pattern we see around Antarctica. So we t take this sort of approach. We look at Antarctica using the parallel ice sheet model. Now, Nick's been running this as a whole continental ice sheet model at 15 kilometer resolution, which enables us to really pick out the sensitivity of these big ice streams draining the majority of Antarctica. Now, that's really important, getting a whole ice sheet model and it runs at sufficient resolution to actually pick up the ice stream dynamics. Now, PISM itself is, is, is an ideal model for this kind of scenario. It picks up the shallow ice shelf, shallow ice uh, sheet approximation at the boundaries, which is fantastic. It crosses the entire domain. So we can pick up these small changes at the periphery are transported straight into the ice sheet itself. The model fit, we've generated a good fit with LGM extent of the ice sheet and thickness of the ice sheet. It disagrees in some parts with the terrestrial record, but we've just driven it with the lateral extents, so they fit for the LGM offshore constraints. And we run this transitory with different freshwater forcings. When we look at the forcings, you can see across on the lower figure here on B, you can see there's a number of different forcings we use. We use a classic Dalio 18 stack. Uh, the Elderfield record with Southern Ocean Benthic Dalio 18. And finally, with two records from Loveclim, which provide 
a freshwater forced record and a non-freshwater forced record. So you've got the yellow and the red records in the bottom there. And you can see that the non-freshwater forced is quite steady through the transition, whereas the freshwater forced gives a remarkable spike at meltwater pulse 1A. Now, the temperature change there, and there's the ensemble mean going through the centre. Now, what this uh, provides us with is a change in mass loss. So by driving the PISM ice sheet model transitory through this uh, time period, we get changes in mass loss, which we can actually start to quantify. Now, here it's measured in gigatons per year, so it just gives you an idea. Now, the black line here is the ensemble mean going through, and again, you've got meltwater pulse 1A there. The grounded ice volume is up on this upper figure here, so you can see that descending through meltwater pulse 1A. And the important thing is that all of the different driving mechanisms produce this meltwater pulse 1A spike, but the Loveklin Love model with Southern Ocean forcing provides a remarkable change in mass loss through this time period. Now, to put this into perspective, we can, we can sort of assess it against available paleo records. Uh, recently, Michael Weber and uh, co-authors have produced a remarkable record of ice rafted debris out off the Weddell Sea in an area called Iceberg Alley, which provides a potential paleo record of ice sheet discharge. Now, this is touted as, as potentially providing a long-term record of change, particularly during these meltwater spikes, and it's, it's suggested that this is the first direct evidence of meltwater pulse 1A from an Antarctic source. Arguably, it's IRD, so it's indirect evidence. But there is a substantial correlation between the ice sheet model, the times in which we get substantial loss of grounded ice change or sea level contribution, and the timing of meltwater to pulse 1A, driven with this sudden ocean forcing. The records here you can see with the various uh, forcing mechanisms, and again, sudden ocean forcing produces this remarkable meltwater spike at the timing of meltwater pulse 1A. We can look at this in a bit more detail. So this is the uh, transitory run of PISM, and you can see the effect these Ice streams are having draining the centre, particularly through that last little transition around 14,000 years ago. Again, the outer, the, the lateral extents agree well with LGM times, and the inner constraints agree well with modern times. Isostatically, the, the model is adjusting through time, and it seems to, as you say, provide the right amount of volume to produce meltwater pulse 1A, and that's the important thing when we look at the ice sheet here. So when we look at this by sector, here we've got obviously time going along the lower uh, axis here, and we can see we've divided into sectors here. So here we've got the Weddell Sea component, obviously the Green the Antarctic Peninsula, Amundsen Sea, Ross Sea, and finally East Antarctica. The again coming in around Meltwater Pulse 1A, you've got remarkable spikes coming from each sector, and a secondary spike post-meltwater pulse 1A coming from the inner shelves, particularly in the Weddell Sea up here, on the peninsula down here. So there's a remarkable uh, contribution from those two sectors. So having a look at the sort of potential drivers here, well, as, as we said, you know, we've seen it in the paleo model, from the paleo modeling front with the work of Laurie and co-authors um, when they actually put fresh water into the southern part of the Southern Ocean, you get remarkable changes in overturning, in bottom water formation, and substantial warming throughout the depth profile in the Southern Ocean. So this fresh water cap is providing a mechanism of getting warm circumpolar deep water and intermediate water onto the shelf. So this is providing us with our mechanism. Worryingly, we see this today going on, particularly in the Weddell Sea, where you've uh, recently um, there's been the paper on cessation of um, convection in the, in the Weddell Sea Polynia. Now, this is sort of showing you that you've got, obviously, normalised convection, 
and through modeling studies showing that there is a remarkable change. And this is also backed up from recent work looking in the Australian Antarctic sector where they're seeing contracting and freshening of Antarctic bottom water. Now the question of whether this will lead to remarkable warming is, is still open. We s seem to develop this real sort of positive feedback mechanism almost like we're seeing in areas like the Edmondson Sea today where you have a substantial freshwater cap going out over the ocean, your normal circulation up here and then with a substantial freshwater cap sourced from in or around Antarctica causes changes in circumpolar deep water and North Atlantic deep water and allows warm water to get onto the shelf to the grounding line of the LGM configuration ice sheet. This produces a substantial positive feedback effect, getting more meltwater, further reducing bottom water formation, which amplifies disintegration, and we seem to see it particularly at, during the Antarctic cold reversal. As we say, we see this in the paleoproxy records with cooling air temperatures over the southern hemisphere. We see a remarkable sea surface temperature anomaly during the ACR, so it seems to be consistent with paleo evidence there. And finally, between around 500 metres and 700 metres, we see a remarkable subsurface warming. Now that's important because, again, it's getting into the grounding line, the key areas of weakness around the Antarctic ice sheet. So sort of to conclude, hose or not to hose, which is the name of the session, well, understanding the sensitivity of these ice sheets to melt water is critical if we're ever going to sort of predict the future, particularly with developing coupled ice sheet models. Given current observations, it looks like you know, to, to really understand the future potential, we really need to get a handle on these regional, almost ice proximal feedbacks. And finally, hose away. I think it's really important to understand where you're doing these hosing experiments and also where it is relative to these weak points in the ice sheet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some questions. Yep. Uh, the question is, what stops the feedback? That's a very good question. Um, obviously, you've got, there are points in the ice sheet where you have significant weaknesses. The question of whether it's just regional changes, perhaps thresholds are, are reached and meltwater slows down, the meltwater input. That might you know, give us, we see substantial changes between the sectors of when, when they start to put in input and when they don't put in input. So maybe it's a, a localized factor. This is very true. So the question is, what actually starts this feedback mechanism? Well, obviously, the, the overall start is driven by the changes coming out of the last glacial maximum. What we're sort of suggesting is these changes are going on close to the ice sheet. And it, again, it's seeing, seeing it from a southern hemisphere perspective, rather than always, say, looking to the North Atlantic here. You've got changes. The ice sheet's sensitive to sea level rise which is important, an important factor, and obviously warming in the ocean as well. But then you get these regional changes within the ice uh, sheet configuration that start to allow these very positive feedback loops to go forward. Yeah, this is a good question, and whether it is a feedback from changes in the North Atlantic, which causing changes to it, weakening in MOC, and then allowing the uh, Antarctic ice sheet to go on. But it's a, it's a good question. And this is, you know, my trying to drive this now with potential of coupled ice sheet ocean uh, models, I think this is a really important thing to, to take account of. These changes, and like I said, they can be incredibly regionally around, regional around Antarctica as well. Let's go for one more question. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think it's potentially a diffuse record, so it's not driving it, let's say, very close to the ice sheet edge. You're just taking a, you know, an average of the Southern Ocean change. I think, obviously, you know, we're looking at an extreme end member here with the Southern Ocean forcing, but in all the ensemble means, we do get a reaction at that time. So it seems to suggest that the ice sheet is very responsive. It's sensitised to changes around that time, whether they be diffuse changes across the ocean or whether they be something more precise. Yes, there is, a, there is an element of... Um, Increasing, yeah, increasing feedback with increasing fresh water. Yeah. 